Hello everybody and welcome to John's Ukulele Cafe. Today I'm honored to have Jim Beloff on this interview with me and I'm going to give you a little introduction to his background. Jim Beloff is the author of The Ukulele, A Visual History by Backbeat Books, an author, arranger, and publisher of the Jumpin' Jim series of ukulele songbooks with over a million copies in print. This series is available worldwide and includes the Daily Ukulele and the Daily Ukulele Leap Year Edition, two of the biggest and best-selling ukulele songbooks ever published. All Jumpin' Jim songbooks are distributed by Hal Leonard. Jim produced Legends of Ukulele, a CD compilation for Rhino Records, and has made three How to Play DVDs for Homespun. He is also an active songwriter and has released a number of CDs. His two CD set, Dreams, I Left in Pockets, features 33 songs he wrote or co-wrote with Uke Legends, Herb, Otisan, and Lyle Ritz. His album, The Wind and Sun, was released in August of 2020. In 1999, he composed and premiered Uke Can't Be Serious, a concerto for solo ukulele and symphony orchestra. Since then, the piece has been performed with both high school and professional orchestras, including the Michigan Philharmonic in 2016, He's also performed it many times with string quartet. His second concerto for ukulele and orchestra, The Dovetail, premiered in 2017 with the Wallingford, Connecticut Symphony Orchestra. Jim and his wife, Liz Mayhawk Beloff, own Flea Market Music, a company dedicated to the ukulele. They perform together playing their family's fluke, flea, and firefly ukuleles. They have toured Japan, Australia, and Canada, and believe in their company's motto, Uke can change the world. You can visit Jim online at his website at fleamarketmusic.com and his Facebook site, facebook.com slash music. But also check out his YouTube channel. Uh, you can just search Flea Market Music Incorporated. So again, thank you so much. I'm really excited to have you on this interview, Jim. And I'm going to start off with the question that I ask everybody. Please tell us about your Favorite ukuleles, we know that you you do play the fluke, flea, and firefly ukes often, but I saw in uh, in the documentary, uh, The Mighty Uke, that you had some interesting ones hanging on your wall as well. Could you tell us a little bit about your, your fun ukuleles you have? Sure. Well, well, first of all, uh, hi, John, and... Uh, <laughs> And, and thanks so much for, for inviting me to come on and, and talk with you. I, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and yeah, you know, uh, we've been doing this for almost 30 years. So, uh, so it all, you know, it all started by finding that first Martin Tenor uke at the Rose Bowl flea market. And in the early days, I just, you know, my eyes were peeled. My wife and I loved to go to flea markets and we had a lot of them where we lived in Los Angeles at the time. So pretty much every Sunday. And, and in those days, it wasn't that hard to find vintage ukuleles on somebody's blanket, you know, at, at a flea market. And so it didn't take too long before we were able to accumulate a fair amount of, you know, these, these vintage ukes. I particularly got into collecting the novelty ones. So, you know, I think for those who are familiar with the brand names, they were Regals, they were Harmonies. I love the ones with the cartoon characters like the, you know, like the, um, oh goodness, I'm completely forgetting now. Uh, but like the Betty Boop and like the Herald Teen. And then also oddly shaped ukes were really, <laughs> were really on my radar. So anyway, those are those make up a lot of our collection. Then over time, we managed to get some some more interesting, um, more you know unique instruments with histories. One of which was uh, was a tiny Tim ukulele. It belonged to him, and um, and it has kind of a fun backstory to it. And I guess probably the one that I I care most deeply about is the one that Lyle Ritz used on his. Uh, on his two jazz albums for Verve from the late 50s. That was a gift from Lyle. And I, I think that is my greatest treasure of all. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, that's that's such a cool collection that you have. And um, I would love to see a picture sometime. <laughs> you just a quick snapshot of all those. Uh, that's, that's fascinating. 
Um, so yeah, the 90s sound like a very interesting time for you and the ukulele and probably your wife as well. Uh, I've seen the Mighty Uke. Maybe some other folks haven't. Um, and yeah, I, I was just interested in hearing, or maybe our inter- our audience would be interested in hearing a little bit of backstory on that. And then also uh, a little bit about the Magic Fluke USA. So I know you play the flukes, and I'm wondering if those are two intertwined things that happen at the, around the same time. Yeah, they did. Um, um, it's funny. I, I have a book coming out um, in mid-November called Utopia, and uh, and it's it's a memoir of sorts, and it's going to feature almost 200 images. So actually, you oh, will cool. be able to see. I just need uh, to buy your book. <laughs> some of our favorite. <laughs> Some of our favorite ukes and and lots of photographs that Liz took over the last 30 years. So it'll be very visual. Um, but um, so so actually this whole story of how it started is 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 laid out in the book. But very briefly, you know, I, I find this uke at the Rose Bowl flea market and um, and we then not too long afterwards find a stash of old vintage ukulele songbooks. Um, and as I'm playing through these wonderful old Tin Pan Alley songs, um, I keep thinking that that there might be some other people out. This is 1992. There might be a few other people who would be interested in this. And um, and so, to make a long story short, we we found a, a, an editor who had connections to Hal Leonard, and at the time, Hal Leonard did not have really any ukulele songbooks in their catalog. And if you went to a music store in 1992 and you know, well, uh, what music stores are like, they have bins and you know, there's the guitar bin and the banjo bin and all that. And in 1992, if you looked in the ukulele bin, often you'd either find it empty or you'd find a, an old copy of Mel Bay's How to Play the Ukulele and Mel is with his, with his coat and tie. <laughs> from the fifties. And so that was about it. You know, as I said, in those days, the ukulele was kind of up off the pop culture radar. And so we, we convinced Hal Leonard that there might be, you know, enough of a market to justify doing a book of some of these wonderful old arrangements I had found in some of these vintage books, the vintage song books we found. And so it was just simply a compilation of, of my favorite arrangements from other old out of print songbooks. And uh, we put it out and, um, and it did better than anyone thought. And so they said, well, why don't you do a how to play book? Cause there really weren't any current how to play songbooks in the market. And we did that. And then that's kind of how it launched. Um, and then not too long after that, we're getting a lot of feedback from people saying, you know what, there's, there, there may be some interest in, 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 first of all, that there's an existing market that's larger than people realized. And secondly, that there may be a, a larger market that could be developed with some attention. And with that then brought up the, the considerable uh, challenge of how to get ukuleles into people's hands because there really weren't many being, being good ones uh, available. This is way before Martin started, you know, making ukuleles again. Uh, almost nobody, as far as I can tell, as I remember, on the mainland was making ukes. So you could get some imported ukes that weren't great sounding. And so I mentioned this to my brother-in-law, Dale Webb, who was uh, an engineer and very familiar with uh, working with wood, um, a real professional with that, and also had some experience with molding. And in his own quiet way, he came up with something that was very non-traditional, um, the fluke. And we introduced it in 1999 and uh, that took off. And so we both ran on kind of parallel tracks, intertwined and parallel. And, um, and they started to make the instruments and we continued to publish the songbooks and, uh, and it continues to this day. That's awesome. Great. Thank you. So you mentioned your book, the uh, Utopia book. Where can we find that later this year? Oh, well, it's actually, it's already on, uh, it's already on Amazon. Oh, it is? Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, you can see the cover there. Um, but uh, 
yeah. So anyway, that's the first place. And of course, we'll somehow make it available on our website as well. Great. So I'll, I'll have more information on that when I when I know myself. Okay. And I'll put the link to that in the comments below so people can find that too. So I'm very interested in reading that. I, I can't wait to look at it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So um, you had printed some smaller books, I believe, first uh, when you started publishing. Was the were the daily ukulele books an outgrowth of that? Did you say uh, people were asking me for a lot of songs, or did you just come up with the idea of the daily ukulele books kind of on your own? Like, how did that happen? Yeah, we uh, th those small books. By the way, actually, th there's a name, an official name for that size. It was known as the octavo size. Hmm. And we we the inspiration for for that was from all of these old out of print books. For those of you who who haunt flea markets and you know and and uh, estate sales, you may find some of these in your travels. They're great, and it was. Um, you know, my sense was that it was a smaller size songbook because it fit in your ukulele case, <laughs> uh, in you know, in the pre in the previous waves of popularity. So, um, so we thought we would honor that. So our first books were really inspired by those early vintage books. Then something else. Um, it was really something else that happened that inspired the daily ukulele books. And that was that we became aware of this phenomenon of ukulele clubs. And, um, and there are some that, had, that, that were quite established uh, well before we did the daily ukulele. One in particular down in um, San, uh, sort of uh, way around uh, San Clemente. Um, uh, was a was a group that had been you know had been coming together for years and they had their own notebook huge mm -hmm. notebook of their own specially arranged songs and then uh, that we were very familiar with and we were very familiar with uh, the gentleman who ran it and um, and then we began to hear about other groups that were forming and you realize that everyone was sort of kind of making up their own books. And, and, and at least when they started out, that was kind of the chief challenge, which is, you know, what kind of resource do we use that we can all play off of together? And so that's when, um, that's when it occurred to us that, that actually creating a book that, would, uh, that was targeted for uh, groups, actually. So in other words, to create a book of songs that would, that would be arranged and would sound good, not just for an individual at home, because certainly the daily ukulele books are perfectly fine for somebody just playing at home, um, but that they would also sound good with 40 or 50 people playing from them. And that, and, and, and that criteria drove the way that, that we arranged that book. Great. I really like how it's formatted and arranged. Uh, I try to now, similarly when I make my own arrangements, make sure that the chord boxes go in order from left to right through the song. I think that's genius. And um, did you ever consider putting strumming suggestions or finger picking patterns or did you want to leave it open to the, the player or the group? Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, I did think about it and you know, when you're dealing with the kinds of songs, especially they're in the first book, um, you know, you're dealing with, you know, you're dealing with public domain songs that go back hundreds of years in some cases. And so there is no official way to play Michael Row the Boat Ashore. <laughs> um, and far be it from me to tell you what that official way is. And it would sound just beautiful finger picked, but it would also sound just as meaningful strummed. And so to, to suggest how it should be played um, was, was, I felt was unnecessary. That, that these songs, that, that every club and certainly every player is, is invited in this book to, uh, to play these songs or perform these songs in whatever way feels most comfortable. And, and the way I dealt with that best was to just simply introduce some basic strumming tips in the front of the book. So there's, you know, some basic finger picking and there's some basic strums and, um, and then apply them where and, you know, where and on what song uh, you prefer. Great. 
Great. That's what I thought. Because with with that on the page, I feel like it would kind of clutter things up a little bit. It just looks nice and neat, and I do appreciate that. And and the uh, ability to kind of create your make your own creation through the songs that you that you wrote. So. And there's another precedent too. Those songs for the daily ukulele are such stand. I mean, that was really the goal was to, you know, was to find if at all possible. And I know that this is all um, subjective to some degree, but but I really did try to find as many songs as I could. Liz and I did to find as many songs as we could that were well known to the vast majority. And, and, and because of that, those songs have been covered, you know, dozens and possibly hundreds of times. And so that's kind of the fun of it. You can, you know, you can pick pretty much any song um, and it's been done by men, it's been done by women, it's been slowed down, it's been sped up, it's, it's been done certainly in different keys. And so, and so far be it from us to say, this is this is the official way that this song should be done. Yeah, and kind of an outgrowth of this question, you, you answered a lot of this already, but uh, somebody had asked uh, if it was difficult to find 365 spots for that, or if you had way more than that, and how did you divide them from yellow book, yellow book to blue book? What were the conscious, conscious decisions you had when you made that decision? Yeah, uh, the um, we, we had no idea we were going to do a follow up. The blue book was, you know, a couple of years away. So when we did the yellow book, it was kind of the one and done. And so we were just going to do one book. And, and, and it was kind of like, I think of it some in some ways as a Noah's Ark. It's try to get, you know, the what the you know, the best ones we could think of that everybody knows into one book. Um, and then the blue book came along because people said, well, are you going to do another one? And, um, and then I realized that, that, that I could justify it because of the leap year. Uh, and we could, we could either provide one more song for leap year, or we could do, we could try to find 366 more. And, and that was a challenge. I will say to go back to your question, um, it, it, gosh, I don't think it was, it was, let me put it this way. I think that the, the, the leap year edition was harder than the first one. I think it was pretty easy to find, um, you know, a lot of songs that everybody knew. Um, you know, to find 365 songs uh, wasn't the challenge that it was to find another 366. But, but we managed, and, and I will say that with the, the follow-up book, we got a lot of help from folks. Um, we invited people to suggest songs. Sure. And so a number of the songs that got into the Leap Year edition were, were suggested by, uh, by fans of the first book. Great. I had a question about the illustrations. So I do see that there's a lot of great vintage photographs. Uh, did your wife do the, the artwork on the, on the inside of the books or did you have somebody else do that? No, Liz did. Um, well, Liz was the art director for all of them, designed the covers, and mm -hmm. and um, and, um, and then I, I think we have, I believe there are illustrations in the daily ukulele. I know there are illustrations in the second book, but um, but there are also tons of photographs, and and, and this idea um, that this idea grew out of probably our third or fourth. Uh, smaller book so it went back a ways and and once you start getting into the groove of creating these song books you realize that inevitably you're going to end up with some songs that don't naturally fill both pages right so if you have a song that takes up two pages uh, in one place you might have a song that fills up a page and a half and so it seems really uh, wasteful <laughs> to have a, a blank half page and so this is when we just decided look this is this is a place where you can put something, uh, make it interesting. And so we decided to never have what you call negative space or blank space. By the time we got to the daily ukulele, we had accumulated just because like everyone else who's into this instrument, you begin to collect stuff. And so uh, amongst the things that we collected besides the ukes and the books and the, and the records, 
uh, and all this stuff, we collected paper and that included, you know, the menus, anything with a ukulele on it. And by the time we got around to the daily ukulele, we had a substantial collection of vintage photographs of people playing ukuleles that we had found either at paper shows or estate sales or, or flea markets, of course. And so we thought, you know, what a wonderful theme to include these vintage photos. And nine, 99 times out of 100, there was no information on the back. It might say a first person's name or something. These are photos that people took that might have been in photo albums that were long ago sold or you know, dispersed and then, then other people bought them and took the photos out and then photo dealers offer them for sale. And so as Liz is picking photos for the daily ukulele, um, she's saying to me, wouldn't it be interesting if somebody someday saw a photo and said, gee, that, by the way, that's my father or my grandfather or my aunt or my uncle. And, and sure enough, it took a while, but uh, I, think, I think we're up to like three or four people now who have contacted us to say uh, that picture on page, you know, such and such is my father or my, or, or my aunt. So that's been kind of a kick. That's awesome. Yeah, that's that's really fascinating. I noticed that in the the documentary, uh, they also had the pictures come up and and move across. So I was like, I know those photos. Those are in the Daily Ukulele book. So, <laughs> all right. So somewhat uh, unrelated to uh, ukulele, but do you all enjoy coffee or tea? <laughs> well, uh, yeah. I mean, I like both. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah that's fine. Uh, I'm working on the song Java Jive with a friend of mine who's a pianist, and uh, he loves the song and loves the ink spots. And he said, you know, you should cover Java Jive sometime. And it's like, I really, I am going to at some point and, uh, you know, would love to use it kind of as like a theme since my channel has to do a lot with coffee and uh, in a cafe and that type of thing. So, uh, but yeah, I was just curious if, if, you know, if that played a role. And I've noticed in a lot of the verses of songs, it does mention coffee. Uh, where I never noticed it before. Uh, so I was just like, oh, great, fantastic. I think I saw your, it must be your 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 town. I saw a, a coffee shop in one of your videos. That's right, yeah. We try to frequent some and get some footage from coffee shops. And I've always wanted to have my own, but uh, just seeing them, the huge cost of having one and uh, just you have to have a commercial kitchen and all these things. So I just I just do it from home and and then just keep dreaming <laughs> that you know I'm in a coffee shop every day or something. So um, great. Well, um, I had a question about uh, well actually somebody else had a question about uh, copyright. So there's a lot of songs in there that uh, were public domain at one point. Can you explain the process of copyright renewal and kind of what that means? Sure. Um, well. I think it's now 19, is it 1922? The cutoff is 1922 or 1923. And, um, and so anything that was copyrighted after 22 or 23 uh, is in copyright. And so you have to, uh, you have to get, you know, you have to uh, get permission to include that in your book. And then every six months, um, checks go out. Now, in the case of, uh, in the case of the Daily Ukulele, that was such an ambitious project that we needed to partner with our distributor. That's Hal Leonard. And mm -hmm. so we jointly uh, own the Daily Ukulele series and, and, and they help us. Uh, um, they, they, they first of all got all the permissions when it came to the songs. And then they also pay the royalties on the songs every, every six months. Everything else, all the other songbooks we do and, and have done every six months, that's our responsibility. And so for all songs that are 22, 23 and afterwards, you pay for you pay for it every six months. Songs before that fall into the public domain. So if you're talking about like you know she'll be coming around the mountain, um, or Oh Susanna, those are in the public domain, and anybody can put those in their book. Typically, you'll see uh, like in our books, but you'll see it at, in most in most song books. There will be a copyright notice under a public domain song. That doesn't mean that we now own that song. It just means, it's really just, it's just, um, 
I, I think that the tradition of that comes from the idea, and we, we certainly didn't come up with this, that you are saying you own the arrangement. Mm -hmm. So anybody, uh, uh, certainly anybody can include Oh Susanna in any book that they put out. Um, but I guess what we're saying is that this particular arrangement is, is under some kind of copyright. Um, I'm not sure that I'd, I'd go very far defending that. But anyway, they don't, they don't earn us anything. In fact, re really the benefit of, of including public domain songs in a book, and in particular doing a book of all public domain songs, is that you don't have to pay any royalties at all. Um, so that's the benefit of it, and and uh, and that's a that's a great thing. So for people who wanna, for example, if if there are those who are watching this and are curious, and they've always wanted to publish their own songbook, one of the easiest ways of doing that is to just put out a book with all songs, you know, pre nineteen twenty two, make your own arrangements. Um, especially a how to book where it's not essential that you have a song in copyright. Um, but you can certainly, you know, present a technique with, you know, with Oh Susanna or whatever it is, and, um, and then you don't have to pay for the royalties for it. Gotcha. Great. Um, so on a totally different subject, do you remember the very first song that you learned on the ukulele? Ah, the first song I learned on the ukulele. Hmm. Well, uh... I can tell you the first song I learned on the guitar because I write about this in the book and I remember it so well. It was um, 500 Miles by Peter, Paul and Mary. Hmm. And, and I remember it because um, it sticks in my mind forever. And I'd like to think that anybody who's watching this might, might have experienced this sensation as well. But I remember the first time I played through a song on a guitar where at some kind of probably very slow tempo, I was singing and changing the chords as I sang. And the idea of following the melody with these changing chords was electrifying for me. A really so electrifying that I've never forgotten it. It was the idea that you are somehow providing your own, you know, uh, accompaniment to a song. And the very first time it happens, it's a little bit, um, it, it, at least in my case, it was really astonishing, uh, memorable. And, um, and, and in terms of the ukulele, the, 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 the best story I can share is that I had worked on a song. I, I'm a, you know, I, you know I, I write about this a lot in the new book, is, is that I came to the ukulele as a songwriter, and that's still, you know, my, my great love. Um, and so I'd, I think, you know, after I'd found the uke, I remembered noodling around with a song on the guitar that had some pretty chord changes to it. Um, and it had kind of an old timey sort of American songbook quality to it, but it didn't seem to work on the guitar. And I pretty much put it out of my mind and I didn't really get back to that song for months because it was around the time that we moved from New York to California to LA. And uh, then when I found the uke, I remembered the tune and all of a sudden the chords just fell into place. And so in some ways, it was a song that I put in on my very first CD called um, Jim's Dog Has Fleas. And the song was called Don't Get Unused to Me. And it had sort of this kind of, you know, Tin Pan Alley quality to it. But the chords just fell into place on the uke, whereas they didn't on the guitar. And that was an eye opener for me. And I realized, wow, I may have just stumbled onto, onto the, onto, for me anyway, the songwriting instrument. For, for the kinds of songs I want to write. Um, so anyway. Great, yeah. I remember that first feeling too of uh, at least playing guitar and when I was in college and I was playing some pretty academic music at the time and I was like, wow, this is so refreshing. <laughs> and then realizing that, you know, I oh, I, I guess I can sing, okay. And I've never had a vo vocal lesson before and, and it was a very an inviting thing, but also really refreshing at the same time, so. That's cool that you had a similar story of your own. So uh, can you share with us some songs that you're working on? Well, 
that you're working on currently or that you plan to put out in the future? Hmm. Uh, well, you know, it's a, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, uh, but uh, I did a record last year, you know, under lockdown situation. I, I recorded all the basic tracks just before lockdown um, here in Connecticut. So the, the uke and the vocals, mostly new stuff. And, um, and on, uh, on those recordings, uh, seven out of the 10 of the songs I had written on baritone uke. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have to say, I've gotten, I've gotten so that I really love, love the baritone ukulele. Tune DGBE, um, low to high, and I, it was an old Martin baritone, and I just love the tone. And it, in some ways, it brought me back to my guitar days, that lower, that lower key. And um, so anyway, I did all these basic tracks and then lockdown, you know, hit. And so I thought, well, this is going to delay the record for, you know, however long. And then I remembered that there were, I had had some wonderful experiences recording with some brilliant musicians in Los Angeles for a prior record. And so I contacted them and said, you know, how are you guys doing? And, you know, and what are you up to? And of course they were like everyone else in the world, they were trapped in their apartments. And I said, well, I've got all these, you know, basic tracks, can I just send them to you? And so that's how the record got finished. Uh, the bass player then took them all, he added bass, then he sent them over to other musicians. And so it all just went through, uh, you know, it all just got moved that way. And then all the, you know, and I was kept in the loop, of course, and then it was finished and sent back. And then we just mastered it back here in Connecticut and put it out. So it's called The Wind and Sun, and you can find it on um, Bandcamp. Uh, if you're curious to hear some of my newer stuff, it does include, um, I've had the great pleasure, great, great pleasure of writing now over 50 songs with the uh, Hawaiian virtuoso Herb Otasan Ota. That's, that's Herb Jr.'s father. Hmm. And uh, he's an extraordinary, extraordinary virtuoso you player, uh, made probably over 80 albums in his career. And he also is a brilliant melody writer. And so when I first met him, gosh, you know, many, many years ago, um, you know, we, we stumbled on this idea of, of him writing tunes and, and my writing lyrics for it. And it's been a wonderful experience. So two of the songs on the album are co-writes with Herb. And then a couple of those songs were written for William H. Macy, the actor, um, one for, one for a Showtime special. I got to know him because of the ukulele. He, he loves the uke. And so we've known each other for many, many, many years. And I've written special material for him during that time. And uh, one of them was for a Showtime special. He did, he, he played an alcoholic. And I, I wrote a fun song called, I Don't Want to Drink Alone. And uh, I always wanted to find a place for that. And so, so that's on the new album. And then I wrote a, I wrote a, a song for him for a movie he directed um, called The Layover, which came out a few years ago. And uh, I wasn't ever sure that this was a song I could, I could consider for an album of my own, but I found a way into it and, it and it ended up being the first song on the album. So two of the songs are from William H. Macy projects. Great, great. So where do you see the future of ukulele heading? Um, and are there any sneak peek releases from flea market music and all, as far as printed music goes? Ah, uh, gosh. Hmm. Well, the first one, where do I see it going? I'll tell you, I'll tell you where I'm, I'm seeing really some, some surprising energy, and that is in the classical world. Mm -hmm. um, especially over in England, because maybe just because I'm in touch with this whole group, that there is a significant, um, uh, uh, cluster of of players who are dedicated to using the ukulele as a classical instrument. And um, part of it, I think, is that there are some universities in England who offer degrees in ukulele. And uh, so part of the syllabus, I guess, is is, you know, mastering a number of classical pieces on the uke. And we've done, we've published four books of classical ukulele. The first one was with John King, who was arguably, 
the finest classical ukulele player in the world. And for those who don't know him, look up John King and add the word ukulele to, to, to hear what John King was capable of doing on a humble four stringed instrument. So we published his book in 2004. And then since then we've done with a, with a brilliant arranger, Tony Mizen, he did a book of lute music <laughs> uh, from the 1500s arranged for ukulele and then a Baroque book for us with a lot of Bach and uh, Vivaldi. And then he did a book, believe it or not, of, of ukulele arrangements of Chopin and Debussy, all in tablature, all with CDs or download downloadable music. And it's extraordinary. And then lately, there seems to be also some individuals who are writing new music, uh, modern classical music for the ukulele. And so I just think all of this is really wonderful um, uh, evidence of, of, of the fact that there is no limit on what this instrument can do. So, so I think that that's, uh, that's very exciting to me anyway. And then um, as far as, you know, the, the, late, the latest book, of course, is this memoir, which will, which will be out this year in November. Um, as far as new song books, we, we never say never. Um, so anything is possible. But um, the last book that we did was a James Hill book of arrangements. It's brilliant called Duets for One for those who are James Hill fans, if you're not familiar with that book, definitely check it out. And, um, uh, and so that's the last one. Have we thought about others? Um, at the moment, uh, I would say we probably think that we've, we've, we've said about as much as we can say in the, in the songbook world, but, uh, but I'm hedging a little bit because who knows? Some, you, you never know, some idea may come along that really strikes our fancy and we'll decide to act on it, so. Yeah, well, I just wanna thank you for meeting me today and uh, it must feel pretty cool to know that you inspired so many people by going to that flea market, picking up a uke, and then deciding, hey, I think we should write some songbooks and how that's changed the landscape as far as ukulele goes and, and just music in general. So uh, I really, really appreciate you meeting me today and I'm sure so many people are gonna be really excited to watch this interview to hear what you have to say so thank you so much jim and until we meet again happy trails <laughs> <laughs> happy trails john yeah all well, right thank you so much thanks so thank you okay goodbye <laughs> aloha yes <laughs>